All right, good afternoon. Um, quick update on the Secretary General's travel. He landed in Moscow a few hours ago. He's currently meeting with the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. Um, after that, uh, he will be uh, doing a press stakeout. We hope to have that video on Web TV, uh, so on UN Web TV, so you can follow it. And it will obviously share the transcript of his uh, remarks. Uh, I've received this morning quite a few questions uh, about the briefing that the UN Special Coordinator, uh, Tor Venesland, uh, provided to the Security Council in a closed session. What I can tell you is that uh, Mr. Vanislan briefed the Council this morning on the situation uh, on the ground as, as the situation on the ground continues deteriorating into, quote, the most serious escalation between Israel and Palestinian militants in years. We are very concerned by the growing civilian casualties in both Gaza and Israel and deeply saddened by the reported deaths of children in Gaza. The Secretary General and Mr. Venislan have both reiterated that Hamas and other militant groups' indiscriminate launching of rockets and mortars from highly populated civilian neighborhoods towards civilian population center violates international humanitarian law and is unacceptable and has to stop immediately. While recognizing Israel's legitimate security concerns, Mr. Venislan also reiterated that Israeli authorities must also abide by their responsibilities under international law, and that Israeli security forces should exercise maximum restraint, calibrate their use of force to spare civilians and civilian objects in the conduct of military operations. The Secretary General is particularly appalled that children continue to be victims of violence. They should be afforded special protection from any form of violence. He and his envoy have called on the international community to take action to enable the parties to step back from the brink and return to the previous understandings that have maintained a relative calm in Gaza and avoid a descent into chaos with the massive casualties and immense damage to civilian infrastructure that that would result. He remind, Mr. Venislan reminded council members that it is the civilian population on both sides that bear the burden of war and that most vulnerable are the ones at greatest risk of suffering. He also highlighted that these devastating cycles of violence, which destroy the lives and futures of Palestinians and Israelis alike, will only stop with a political solution to the conflict. At the end, and end, and excuse me, and end to the occupation and realization of two-state solution on the basis of UN resolutions, international law, existing agreements, uh, with Jerusalem as the capital of both states. And on the humanitarian front, our humanitarian colleagues say that the current risk of escalation uh, will likely worsen the humanitarian situation, especially in Gaza, where the health sector has been struggling to provide basic services for years and has been burdened further by COVID-19. Funding for the humanitarian response is critical. The humanitarian response plan for the occupied Palestinian territory asking for $417 million to help 1.8 million vulnerable Palestinians is only 29% funded. And from UNICEF, the executive director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, said today that at least 14 children in the state of Palestine and one child in Israel have been reportedly killed since Monday. She noted that another 95 children in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and three children in Israel have reportedly been injured in the past five days. Ms. Four said the situation is at dangerous tipping point with the level of violence and its impact on children being devastating. In any war, she said, children, all children, suffer first and the most. Ms. Four called on all sides to end violence and de-escalate tensions, urging them to protect all civilians, especially children. And this morning, um, after the Security Council members heard from Mr. Vanisland, they had an open meeting on Yemen. Uh, Special Envoy Martin Griffiths told council members that despite redoubled efforts in recent months to reach a peaceful resolution to the Yemen conflict, he unfortunately could not report today that the parties are closing in on a deal. Instead, he said there's been relentless military escalation by Ansar Allah in Marib and continued restrictions on imports through Hudaydah, 
contributing to sev severe fuel, fuel shortages. There's also been restrictions on Yemeni's freedom of movement across the country, including the continued closure of Sana'a Airport, as well as the absence of a political process, which deprives Yemenis of hope that an end to the conflict is near. Mr. Griffith said the Ansar Allah offensive in Marib, which has been ongoing for more than a year, has caused an astonishing loss of life. And uh, also briefing the council was Mark Lokok, the emergency relief coordinator, who said that the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is trapped in a relentless downward spiral. He said that famine is still stalking the country with five million people just a step away from starving. COVID-19 is still surging, pushing the healthcare system to collapse. Mr. Lokok underlined that famine, disease, and other miseries are not simply happening in Yemen, but that war is imposing them on Yemen. As long as the war continues, they will keep getting worse, he said. He called for urgent action on protecting civilians, increasing humanitarian access, stepping up funding, improving the economy, and making progress towards peace. And on Myanmar, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that on the ground they are concerned about the impact of the continued clashes in the north and northeastern parts of the country between the Myanmar military and ethnic armed organization, as well as amongst ethnic armed organizations themselves. In Kachin State, for example, some 10,000 people have fled their homes due to renewed fighting. In northern Shan, more than 12,000 men, women, and children have been displaced since the start of the year. More than half of those families remain displaced. And our colleagues in Myanmar also tell us they're concerned by the situation in the southeastern parts of Myanmar, where more than 40,000 people have been uprooted since February due to the attacks by the military and the Kayan National Liberation Army, including airstrikes, artillery, and mortar shelling. Several thousand people cross the border to Thailand and India to escape the violence. The UN and our partners are working to help some one million people in conflict-affected areas of Myanmar. Their efforts are hampered by insecurity as well as basic access and funding. And yesterday afternoon, we released a statement on Myanmar saying that 100 days since the Myanmar military takeover has left hundreds of civilians killed, including numerous arbitrary arrests and other human rights violations. The Secretary General renews his call on the country's military to respect the will of the people and act in greater interest of peace and stability in the country. The Secretary General also encourages ASEAN to swiftly follow through on its own commitments and the international community to support regional efforts to bring an end to the repression by the military. He also calls on the international community to respond to the increased humanitarian needs. The Secretary General Special Envoy, Christine Schragner Bergener, is in the region and continues to engage intensively with key uh, stakeholders, including in light of the broader ramification of the crisis. She continues to promote coherent international action. The Secretary General, for him, his part, will continue to stand with the people of Myanmar. Moving on to Somalia, which is experiencing a double climate disaster. Recent torrential rains are causing the loss of lives and flash flooding about two weeks after a drought was declared in the country. Our humanitarian colleagues warn that the combined effects of drought and flooding may worsen the situation in Somalia, where more than 2.7 million people are food insecure. More than 80% of Somalia was facing moderate to severe drought conditions when seasonal rains started in parts of the country in uh, late April and earlier this month. At least 25 people have died in various parts of Somalia due to the floods, among them nine children who lost their lives when their houses were flooded in the Banadir region earlier this week. And in the Juba River has now burst its banks. There are reports of flooding in the northern part of Somalia. We, along with our partners, have reached at least 353,000 people in drought-impacted areas with assistance. Urgent efforts are underway to respond to flash flooding. Despite increasing humanitarian needs, Somalia's 2021 humanitarian response plan requiring a billion dollars to help 4 million people is only 19 percent funded. And turning to Ethiopia, where we are told that while there is some positive news in Tigray's humanitarian access, the situation remains fluid and unpredictable. Blockades by military forces have in recent days severely impeded access in rural areas where humanitarian needs are most severe. 
armed hostilities reportedly continued in northwestern, central, eastern, southeastern, and southern zones. Of the 3 million people targeted to receive emergency shelter and non-food items, only 347,000 people, that's about 12%, have been reached since May 3rd. With the start of the rainy season, our humanitarian colleagues warn it is critical that aid agencies can provide minimal dignified shelter for the displaced. An estimated 5.2 million people in Tigray, more, that's more than 87% of the population, need food assistance. Between the 27th of March and May 5th, the government, the World Food Program, and other partners have provided food aid to more than 1.2 million people in 32 districts, water trucking to nearly 700,000 people. A quick update from the DRC, where the head of the UN peacekeeping mission there, Beitou Keita, is in the eastern region of the country for a week-long visit. Today in Goma, she met with the new authorities in North Kivu province. They were appointed following a siege of announced by the president for initial, excuse me, um, they were appointed following a state of siege announced by the president for initial period of 30 days in North Kivu and Ituri provinces. Speaking to the media, she said that the, uh, she said that <coughs> discussions with the governor and the vice governor of North Kivu were focused on clarifying roles and responsibilities, adding that there was also, quote, renewed hope and, thanks, and that thanks to all efforts, as well as trust and contributions of the population, she is hopeful the security situation will improve. And in the Central African Republic, uh, the UN mission there continues to provide support for conducting of the next legislative elections as part of their electoral mandate and to ensure protection of civilians. Earlier this week, the support, with the support of the UN mission, the national electoral authorities began deployment of trainers from Bangui to the prefectures. They will train members of the national electoral authority uh, involved in the legislative elections, which takes place on May 23rd. They will also supervise the training of polling station personnel. And the Strategic Communication and Public Information Division of the UN Mission also continues to provide support to enhance media coverage of the elections in view of the growing threat of misinformation. The dissemination of accurate and reliable messages is even more vital. A uh, couple of COVID-related items. You will have seen that WHO's uh, Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, led by Helen Clark and Ellen Solif Johnson, released their findings. Uh, for his part, the Secretary General has been briefed on the report's recommendations. He welcomes the dynamic leadership of the panel. He hopes the report will be, uh, bring attention to the critical issues highlighted and will prompt governments to implement its recommendations. We, remain, we fully support the full package of recommendations. And today in Kosovo, a second batch of COVID-19 vaccines from COVAX was received with the help of UNICEF. The vaccine campaign kicked off there in March when Kosovo received an in first, its first shipment of COVAX. More doses are expected in a few weeks. The Philippines has also recently received another shipment of COVAX-backed vaccines. Some 4.5 million doses have been committed to the country through COVAX in total. We've provided support for national vaccination campaign, which targets priority groups first. I uh, want to thank our friends in Port-au-Prince for paying their budget dues in full to the 2021 budgets, which brings us up to 101 members. And tomorrow, as you know, is um, Eid al-Fitr, and the UN will be closed. We will always be, uh, as always, be available to you uh, via electronic means. But we will see you back here on Friday. Um, and I'm sorry, but I have to sit down. I cannot stand anymore. I'm so much. That's right, thank you. All right, Celia, please. Uh, Stefan, uh, about WHO, um, uh, that WHO knew of sex abuse claims by Dr. Diallo in Congo during the Ebola crisis, but did nothing. Do you know anything about it? Um, yes, I do know some things about that. <laughs> I also would love read, to know. I also read um, 
what is printed. Um, first of all, I think um, we are aware of these, uh, obviously aware of these allegations, but I think as always when we talk about sexual abuse, it's important for us to be uh, very clear, to say that every allegation of sexual abuse is to be taken seriously and is taken seriously. Um, we obviously, uh, you know, much has been done in the DRC on this issue, but we obviously need to be vigilant and need to do more. Uh, in whatever context these abuses take place, um, we know that uh, the risk of sexual abuse is an ever-present danger, and it breaks the trust of the very people we are meant uh, to be um, to there to serve. All allegations need to be investigated, and all victims need to be heard. Uh, I know WHO is looking to this matter, so I think you should uh, ask them for any further uh, information. I, and I know from speaking to them uh, this morning that um, they are scheduled to make some comments uh, a, bit, uh, a bit shortly. Okay. Chris, Ms. Salome, please. Thanks, Stefan. I'm wondering if the Secretary General has any reaction to the Security Council's inability to come together on the situation in the Middle East and issue any kind of a statement. Would well, that have been helpful? Well, we, we, you know, we don't think that all uh, hope is lost. We always, um, any international situation will always benefit from a strong and unified voice from the Security Council. We hope that council members um, find have the ability uh, to issue uh, a statement. If to some. A follow-up first on that. Uh, so the Security Council, the failure of the Security Council to issue a statement has to do a according to diplomatic resources to uh, with the refusal of the US uh, to do so and the US was the only country uh, who opposed that do you have any comments on that uh, uh, you obviously speak to more diplomats and have access to more diplomats than I do okay. uh, I, I and I'm not uh, I'm not questioning at all what you're what you're saying is just I, I'm not able to comment on the uh, inner workings of, uh, of council members. We hope that whatever uh, issue there is gets resolved, and we would, as, as always, uh, we would want to hear a, a strong unified message uh, from the Security Council. Uh, your statement regarding the, uh, the security concerns of uh, civilian Israelis. Do you believe that Palestinians, civilian Palestinians, have also security concerns uh, and that you should comment on them and take them into consideration? I think, you know, I think we have, uh, we have commented on it. And I, I think each case of the use of force needs to be analyzed, investigated, and, uh, and dealt with. As we've said, uh, Palestinians have the right to demonstrate peacefully, express themselves without fear, of harm, and we've consistently called on Israel to refrain from excessive force uh, in such context. Um, civilians, whether in Israel, whether in the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, should not be made the target of acts of terror or subjected to, um, uh, to rocket attacks. Uh, last one uh, for now, at least. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, I'll follow up on that. As a matter of fact, uh, you did condemn uh, the uh, launching of uh, missiles uh, by Hamas toward Israel, but you did not condemn, uh, the SG did not condemn uh, the killing of Palestinians and attacks on Al-Aqsa uh, Al Mosque and uh, other uh, places. A, uh, and on civilians. My question is, uh, and I know we asked these questions in the mm -hmm. last few days, my question is actually, is uh, the Secretary General afraid to uh, take any uh, uh, action or to, 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 to any statement on this issue because he's standing for elections and afraid from no, the American no, no, uh, uh, support that they will not support him if he does so? No, that's the short answer. 
the Secretary General has repeatedly condemned uh, the use of force uh, against, uh, against civilians. Um, Including Palestinian we, civilians? Civilians, civilians are civilians. No, but you are I, I'm not. Just say, I'm just I'm, saying, I'm answering the, your question to the best of, of my ability. To, Toby. But you didn't, that, uh, uh, yeah. yeah no. So uh, the, the question, is he afraid? No, I, I, I think I answered that first part by saying no. Uh, Toby. Thanks, Steph. So uh, follow-up from yesterday, do Palestinians have a, a right to self-defense? Uh, you know, I, I think there was some legal hesitation there or something? I think, as I, as I, as I just told Ibtissam, I think each case of use of force must be analyzed, investigated, and dealt with on its own terms. And I, I refer you what, what I've just, to what I just said to um, to, to do they have like a common sense right to self-defense? Any use of, uh, of force needs to be analyzed. It needs to be investigated, dealt with on its own, uh, own terms. No civilians, whether Palestinians, whether Israelis, uh, should be made the, the target of, um, of terror, of, uh, of, uh, of rocket attacks. Um, civilians need to be protected. Um, second question is, how concerned should we be about war right now? I mean, are, are we on are we on a war path? Uh, who? What did Mr. Wanislans say in that regard? I think we are very concerned about uh, an escalating spiral of violence. Uh, the as as we've just uh, you know. Any violence, any increase in the spiral of violence will just continue uh, to hurt the future of Palestinians, of Israelis. Um, our position has been clear that the only solution to this is a political solution uh, based on existing UN resolution, based on the end, uh, on the end of, a, of the occupation, and the realization of a two-state solution. OK, Alan. Thank you, Stefan. A little bit different topic. Uh, do you have any updates on the activities of uh, UN groups at the area of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict, be it uh, humanitarian or demining or anything? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I think we would we we as we would like to see. Uh, excuse me. We would like to have. Uh, the unhindered humanitarian access in Nagorno-Karabakh as we ask for in other parts of the world. To date, this has not been possible because we've not received the necessary authorization from the Azeri authorities. However, we are hopeful that we'll see progress on this soon. Okay, uh, Liling and then Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. A follow-up on the question about the sexual allegations involving the World Health Organization. Um, was the Secretary General aware? When was he made aware? What's his response? And um, to what extent can the SG assert his zero tolerance policy on the WHO, where it comes to sexual abuse and exploitation? We've been aware of some of the allegations that have already been uh, that have already been reported. Uh, our reaction uh, is that. Every case needs to be fully investigated. Every victim needs to be heard. If there, are, uh, if there is wrongdoing uh, by UN staff, by NGOs, uh, there needs to be accountability uh, in, in, that, in that remark. We work uh, with WHO as part of our kind of unified uh, UN-wide system <laughs> approach uh, to sexual exploitation and abuse. And I know from speaking to them this morning, they are uh, more than fully aware of the situation. I think they'll have a, they'll have a bit more to say uh, a bit later on. Okay. Thank uh, you. Abdel Hamid, uh, and then Evelyn. Uh, thank you, Stefan. I have a couple of questions. I hope, I hope you'll bear with me also. I always, always so, do, Abdel Hamid. Thank you. Can you qualify what's going on now in Gaza now as an act of aggression? 
you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm going to qualify it as a, a extremely dangerous uh, and ever-growing cycle of violence uh, that will hurt first and foremost civilians. Uh, okay. The statement you have just said uh, from Winsland, Mr. Winsland did not put the uh, background of what happened, which started in Jerusalem and started ex exactly on Friday evening when Israeli security forces invaded Al-Aqsa Mosque, brutalized the worshippers, and left 300 people wounded. That is how it started. Why he didn't put that background before he talked about rocket fire? Ms. Mr. Van Island, this is sort of the highlights of uh, uh, the expression. Let me put it this way. This is the expression of our opinion and our analysis of the, of the situation. In his closed briefing to the to the uh, Security Council, uh, I know he also reported uh, the facts uh, the facts on the ground. Your other question. One more question. Yep. One more question, Stefan. Do people under occupation have the right to resist their occupiers? Look, I think I've I've answered uh, I, I've answered that uh, question. There's a body of of international law. Uh, international humanitarian law, and you're free to consult it. Uh, Evelyn. Evelyn? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Steph. Uh, when do you expect a replacement to be named for Mr. Griffiths on Yemen? I would first have to announce that he has a new job, which I don't believe I had. Ah, but he does, doesn't he? Um, and uh, secondly, on the WHO, the group analyzing the pandemic for WHO, uh, one, I wondered if you or the Secretary General reacted to one of their findings, which was that after China revealed uh, the, the the problem or the disease, uh, the virus. Um, there was there there was no world leaders that took up the slack and began to publicize it and decided to do something. Uh, they, the oh, lack I, of internet. I, I think the the the, sec the secretary general has been very clear from the beginning about the lack of coordinated national responses uh, from member states. He's also been very clear about the fact that, you know, WHO has gotten a lot of criticism, but a lot of that criticism is because the way it has been set up by member states, the way the governance exists by member states, doesn't really give uh, the organization much teeth. Um, and he's always said that, you know, the, the international public health system needs to have a bit more teeth. Thank okay. You. On that dental note, uh, Stefano. Stefan, uh, today the, the United States, UK, and Germany hosted um, an event on uh, the situation of um, the province of Xinjiang in, in China on the human rights situation there. And uh, I think uh, no um, uh, Michel Bachelet and no no one from the UN participated with the speech or anything. So is uh, what the Secretary General think about? Uh, I mean, we know that the Chinese uh, mission here was uh, issue a statement where they were very uh, upset about this, and uh, many countries participated, but other countries didn't participate. What does the Secretary General think about this event? Do you, do, does he think it was important to to be, you know, to 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 be held up, or he thinks it was a provocation? Look, member states hold events here all the time. Uh, this is part of what the UN is all uh, is all about. It's not for the Secretary General. Uh, to opine uh, on events organized uh, by, by member states. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Was uh, the fact that there was no participation by, uh, by 
officer for the UN, I mean, for example, from the office of Bachelet, was something to do, I mean, is this something normal or, or what that, what, 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 well, what the I Secretary you should, General you should, thinks? Uh, I, first of all, I think that the High Commissioner herself has expressed uh, on a number of occasions serious concerns about uh, the situation for human rights uh, in Xinjiang. There's also the discussions ongoing about uh, access. Um, my understanding is that uh, her office did receive uh, an invitation that she was unable to uh, to attend. But I would have encouraged you to uh, ask our human rights colleagues uh, in Geneva about more details on that. Okay. Um, Toby, and then I'm going to go see a back doctor. Sorry, Steph, I, I hope you're all right. Yeah. Um, if you see me do the briefing lying down on Friday, I think you'll get that. You'll figure out the answer to that. Yes. Prone on the days. Um, yeah. Did you, uh, just a follow up to, to Stefano's question, did you receive, did the Secretariat receive any other invitations from the UK, US, or Germany no. uh, for briefers my, on? My understanding is that the, the invitation went to our human rights colleagues. Yeah. Uh, Beitul, wherever you are. Thank you, Steph. Sorry, I don't have a video today. A follow-up question on that uh, meeting today at the UN. Uh, since the Human Rights Commissioner has no access to China's Xinjiang region to investigate the human rights violation, there were some calls at today's meeting for the Secretary General to set up an investigation team, just like he did uh, in Syria. Would he consider setting up uh, a UN investigative team to, because there is no access uh, by the UN to, to that region at the moment? Look, uh, I think we have made very clear the Secretary General's position on the situation. Uh, in Xinjiang, as you know, he has raised it uh, on a number of occasions, as we've said here in his, with his interlocutors uh, in China. Uh, we very much hope uh, that the discussions between uh, the High Commissioner's Office and uh, the Chinese authorities on, on a possible visit uh, will, bear, uh, will bear fruit. Um, and as for, uh, in theory, the set setting up of any sort of uh, investigation inquiry into any place in the world, that would require uh, a mandate from a legislative uh, body, I think is, and I will leave it there. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and he's no bar. And to you. Yeah.